afternoon. And welcome to this next episode of Governance Dialogues, a program that I have the pleasure to host on a weekly basis. And Governance Dialogues is aimed to explore various governance priorities in hard-hitting conversations with thought leaders, be they private or public sector experts that have an interesting and unique perspective on governance. My name is Lisa Cole, and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center, which is a think tank and advisory firm focused on um, promoting and advancing governance priorities uh, in the public and, and private sectors. And for those of you who have not had a chance to tune in to previous uh, episodes of Governance Dialogues, we've explored a number of topics, one of which um, has of course been uh, the other side of, of good governance, which is fraud and corruption. Um, in two particular episodes, one of which was in conversation with the former Department of Justice, a senior counsel responsible for uh, investigation of uh, corrupt um, companies, uh, Hui Chen, and the second one was um, the head and the founder of uh, investment uh, advisory in a research firm, Anthony Shlipati, um, which who joined us uh, from Canada. And today I would like to further um, explore this uh, perspective or the, the, some of the unfortunately uh, emerging uh, issues related to fraud and corruption uh, in this particular episode focusing on foreign uh, listed companies. And we think this is an issue that merits much more attention and unfortunately uh, an issue that has not received sufficient attention in the, in the public uh, sphere and in the financial media. And if you look at some of the numbers today, uh, foreign listed companies, it, according to OECD's latest statistics, there are about 8,000 of them worldwide that have listed on public equity markets since about mid 1990s. And they have raised in the order of $1.4 trillion of uh, equity. And of course, of that number, um, the vast majority or uh, a large number of companies are indeed Asian companies. About 500 um, Asian companies are listed outside of their uh, domestic market and about 120 are uh, dual listed um, uh, companies. And these are important differences. And so the issue of, of foreign listed companies uh, is an important one for, for, from our perspective to address further. Of course, if you look at the numbers um, in the global picture of things, uh, they still account for about 4% of, uh, of um, listed companies worldwide today. But if you look at, again, the financial press, some of the most um, egregious governance scandals unfolding currently, and I would like to today explore two of them, the uh, NMC case, which is an Amirati healthcare company listed uh, uh, on NASDAQ, or was listed on NASDAQ, and Luckin Coffee, uh, a Chinese company listed um, uh, on, on, on uh, NASDAQ, sorry, the former one on the London Stock Exchange, and the second one on NASDAQ. These are two uh, cases that we think uh, merit much more attention. And to investigate or to discuss these cases, I couldn't think of a, of a better invitee than Carson Vlog, who is joining us uh, today uh, directly from the United States to share his experience on, on looking at these two cases. And his firm, um, as those of you who have been following the financial press, has played uh, a fundamental role in, in sort of blowing the whistles on, on both uh, Luckin Coffee and NMC. Carson, welcome to Governance Dialogues. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Alicia. Um, it's a pleasure to have you, particularly given your direct uh, implication or direct experience with, with those, these two cases. And um, for the benefit of our audience, you are the um, founder and CIO of uh, Muddy Waters Research, uh, a company that originated, originated its business looking at uh, Chinese issues, but now is looking increasingly at, at uh, companies worldwide and fraud in, in, in issues worldwide. Um, you've been ranked as one of the most influential uh, thinkers by Bloomberg Markets. And indeed, um, I have to say your uh, perspective or your word certainly counts when we look at developments and uh, impact on share prices. When you announced your short position on NMC, uh, the market, uh, sh the, the share price of NMC went tumbling uh, immediately. And I would like to go straight to these two cases, NMC uh, and Luckin. Um, in your own words, and, and I quote uh, from your own website, because I really love that sentence, muddy waters peels back the layers often built up by seemingly respected but sycophantic law firms, auditors, and VLR management. Um, could you tell us a little bit more, what, what is the approach that your firm takes in investigating these cases? And what were the particular signposts that led you to uh, suspect um, um, instances of fraud in NMC and Luckin Coffee? Sure. So um, th they're they're quite different um, in in certain respects. Um, 
I'll start with NMC. And to be fair, we our role in Luckin was I, I consider it to be peripheral. Um, we are actually more involved, much more involved in another uh, US listed China fraud um, called GSX. And that's something that we've been publishing on for about the past month. But um, in any event, I'll, I'll address Luckin and you know, do my best to give you perspective on that. NMC, the issue there, um, among others, um, is that there's a tremendous amount of debt that was never reported. So NMC, its last report was uh, for the first half of 19, and it reported 2.1 billion US of debt. Now that was a discounted value, uh, or present value of the debt, but you know, we don't really know what the, you know, the face value is, but it shouldn't be that far north. Um, what came out subsequent to our reporting and the internal investigation was that there was actually, I think, 6.6 .6 billion of debt that's been identified so far. Um, really no explanation given publicly of what is going on. But with NMC, I mean, what drew our attention to it was the too good to be true aspect. And that's often the case with the companies that, that we report on. Um, you know, and I also want to explain that we're not only doing frauds. There's a huge category that I would argue is actually more insidious in terms of its impact on capital markets than outright fraud. And that is what we call the legal fraud. So the companies that are not doing anything wrong, but can still materially alter or manipulate their financial statements. Uh, but anyway, the NMC, the two good to be true aspects, the profit margins were much higher than the comps, um, highly acquisitive, but raising a lot of debt. And often those, those two things, out of whack profit margins or sales growth and highly acquisitive companies that are funding the acquisitions with external financing, one is a red flag, the other is a yellow to red flag, maybe an orange flag. So those were the two things that drew us to uh, NMC in the first place. Luckin, Luckin, is a, Luckin is a strange one. I mean, we did not do the research there. We published somebody else's research report. We received the research report in January. We had a couple of days in a data room to do some diligence on it. Um, I know who the author was somebody I've known for several years, the author wished to remain unattributed. And we thought that the work was directionally correct. We couldn't validate it down to every minute detail. And this is something we hadn't done before, but we felt confident in the work based on our diligence of it. So we tweeted it out and well, we took a short position and then I tweeted the report out. So luck and unwound from there, um, but not, it's not our research. It's not. It's not. Um, yeah, it's, there. It's true that there. Are, there are some parallels, perhaps, but there are different cases. And I would like to ask you, in sort of, um, insofar as these two companies are listed in, you know, completely different markets, different capital market regulation, different cap corporate governance regulations, and in the U.S., you know, as, as we know, corporate governance regulations emanate more from the stock exchanges, and in the U.K., it's a little bit of a more of a, an FRC story. Would you, in your analysis? Uh, of, of these two cases, but also of other companies, be looking at specific regulational elements, um, sort of looking at the regulatory environment and uh, in relationship to each market and, and looking at these companies through the prism of these markets, or is it sort of a, a similar methodology that you would deploy regardless of locations or, or um, regulatory environment of the issuer? Well, for these two companies, when looking at them, because they are in emerging or if you're looking at a frontier market company, I'd say the same thing. You know that you have weak rule of law, and that means that there are going to be a lot of willing co-conspirators in those countries who will conspire with top management to commit fraud because those people are effectively beyond the reach of the laws of the UK or the US. So when they set up sham companies to enter into sham transactions, with a company listed in London or the US, then they get paid what to them is a lot of money, but to what the management that just raised 
hundreds of millions of dollars or has raised maybe billions of dollars is pocket change, that's when you get, that's when you get these distortions. That's when you get these frauds. So I also want to make a, in a very important point here, though. This doesn't only apply to emerging frontier market companies that are listed in developed markets. Many companies that originate and are headquartered in developed markets have significant operations in emerging markets, especially China. And these companies are getting ripped off and defrauded internally all the time. And sometimes that can be quite large. There was a scandal several years ago with Caterpillar and its China operation, Joy Global and its China operation. Hmm. Anecdotally, from when I was in China and people I've talked to, multinationals being ripped off for tens of millions of dollars by a small group of employees is actually not that unusual. Okay. Well, it's, it's, so certainly there are two, two separate issues. I mean, companies, as you, as you point out, the, the, the issue of fraud is not, of course, uh, the only territory of, of foreign listed issues. It's just that this particular dialogue is, is particularly focused on, on, on that. But I would like to go back to um, a recent statement of the chairman uh, of the Security and Exchange Commission, and I quote uh, in his recent analysis or his recent um, commentary, particularly on Chinese um, uh, companies listed in the U.S., he said, in, in many emerging markets, including China, there is substantially greater risk that disclosures will be incomplete or misleading, and the event of investor harms is substantially less access to recourse in comparison to U.S. domestic companies. So he basically um, went in so far as to say that we, we, you know, we don't uh, disown any responsibility, but we have an issue as a, as a, as a regulator. Um, what are your views or sort of recommendations to regulators, be they SEC or FRC or others, in terms of how foreign, issue, foreign issues should be regulated? Is, in your, is your view that currently there is sufficient regulation, it's just a question of enforcement or application on an occasional basis? Or is there, um, let's say, a lax approach to foreign issuers listed in premium markets such that it creates a material risk for institutional investors? My advice is to stop talking about it and to do something about it. You know, it, it might seem extraordinary for the chairman of the SEC to issue this statement, except the SEC did the same thing in 2011 or 2012, and nothing changed. And in fact, in 2012, I believe, the U.S. enacted something called the Jobs Act, which really, I, th I thought at the time was just about creating jobs in boiler room finance. But now you have all of these PRC based issuers who are issuing in the US under the protective provision or the light disclosure regime of the Jobs Act. And so they don't even have to, they're not even being held to the same standards of internal controls audits as more established companies are. Now, what do I mean by doing something about it? Um, in the case of China-based listings, particularly China to US, it's egregious what has gone on. I and mean, there's a movie called The China Hustle. It's a documentary released in 2018. I was a second level protagonist. It chronicles how there were literally hundreds of PRC-based companies who came to the US capital markets, collectively raised many billions of dollars, and were either exposed as frauds or went dark or trade at clear fraud valuations today. Um, and yet, Unfortunately, the chairman of the SEC, it was the lead lawyer on Alibaba's 2014 IPO. Um, this problem kind of went out of view from 2012 until 2014, and U.S. investors just forgot all of the bad history and, you know, forgot their skepticism, and, you know, we were off to the races. But the main, one of the main, most galling and glaring issues here in this, in this dynamic has been that the US created an accounting regulator or an auditor regulator after the Enron collapse called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB. PCAOB's remit is to periodically inspect auditors, registered auditors. So you have to register with PCAOB if you're going to audit companies that are publicly traded in the US. So the PCAOB's remit is to inspect them. China has always prohibited inspections 
of the PRC affiliates that actually do these audits. And this became a big issue back in 2012, and it was on the strategic economic dialogue agenda for a while between the US and China. Ultimately, the Obama administration, I think, decided that they had bigger fish to fry with China, and China signed a memorandum of understanding with the PCAOB, but that was just intended clearly to be a stalling tactic. And so here we are today, we still don't have inspections, and this is the bare minimum. I mean, I've, I, I used to make the point to the people I talked to at that time at the PCAOB that, I mean, look at how these companies commit fraud, okay? You, if you are inspecting the auditors, big deal, you will get messed with. And you know, they said, we understand, but it's the bare minimum that we can ask for. But those inspections still do not occur. Then you go to this year and China uh, revised its securities law. And there's a new article. So previously, all of these companies based in China that were listed overseas, the China authorities had no jurisdiction, which makes sense. I mean, they were defrauding foreign investors. This new securities law confers exclusive jurisdiction in the China of, uh, over these companies within the China Securities Regulatory Commission, the CSRC. It's interesting that, I mean, you're, you're pointing out to the issue of, of auditors, and of course it's a, it's a top uh, priority now with the number of uh, E&Y uh, cases uh, all over the press, not, not only specific to, to foreign issues, but in general, they are, they are being investigated on the NMC, as, as we both know, but, but also on, on many other cases. Um, and I think it, it, um, this veers into the territory of capital markets regulation versus politics. And I think there we, you know, um, you know, whether we allow uh, American, um, American audit firms to China and also on the other side of, of this coin, uh, we've heard in the last few weeks, uh, the, the Trump administration uh, basically tried to prevent one of the uh, 600 billion actually national thrift savings plan uh, fund uh, investing in any Chinese companies, whether they're listed in, in the US or even abroad. So there are clearly other sort of political uh, dynamics unfolding there. What I thought is interesting in respect to our conversation is that um, a week, about a week after the announcement by the Trump administration that they want to stop federal, um, federal uh, thrift plan from investing in Chinese companies, NASDAQ had uh, announced uh, quite unexpectedly, I think, at least in my view, um, the uh, revision of its listing requirements um, allegedly in, 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 in uh, response to the, to the Luckin case. And I wonder if we, we, we could get your thoughts as to whether that revision uh, and what was announced in it in terms of the raising of the, uh, of the bar um, on the size of the companies, the sponsorship requirements, the management origins, et cetera, is that enough um, and it, or is it just a political uh, move uh, by the Trump administration? All right, well, okay, t so two different, two different issues. There's what has the Trump administration done here in NASDAQ? So the Trump administration, I think this was symbolically important. Um, unfortunately, look, the capital markets, as you know, basically I think most of capitalism, have been co-opted by interests that don't necessarily have the good of society as a whole in mind. And so when we look at what the Trump administration did with respect to some federal pension money, this was a response to MSCI, uh, which puts together the most influential indices in the world. And as a sidebar, maybe I'm missing something, but I'm not sure why this business is so big. I mean, how hard would it be for any of us to put together some indices? I mean, I could just throw some darts against the wall, worst case scenario, and do it for a lot less money. But MSCI, it's been reported, MSCI was pressured into adding mainland China exchanges to its, its indices and upping the overall weighting of China. Apparently, very, various organs of the Chinese government said, we will cancel our contracts with you if you don't make these changes. So boom, the, the weightings got up. <laughs> the mainland exchanges, which are completely fake markets. I mean, just go back to, I think it was the summer of 2015 when they were throwing in prison people who were short selling because they wanted the market to go up. These you know, non-market markets have suddenly been added to these indices. So all of these passive investors, which include a lot of pension money, now are throwing money and rewarding this you know, 
faux capitalism. So I think symbolically what the Trump administration did there was important. I really think that there has to be significant regulation and reining in of MSCI because face it, you know, they're not out here to be our friends. They're out here to make money for themselves. Um, so that's one thing, NASDAQ. Oh boy, when an exchange pretends that it cares about the quality of companies listed. Um, yeah, I mean, let's not forget that exchanges themselves are publicly traded. And I think prior to the publicly traded exchange era, it was fair to say that the exchanges definitely prioritized the interests of their individual members over those of the public. But I think that they were much more likely to see the long-term health of the exchanges as being in their interests than when you turn them into publicly traded companies where they make their they have to make their quarterly numbers and their their stock comp packages are enormous. I mean that's the problem with the public company system in general is starting in the 80s this thought that well you align the interest of management by giving them a ton of, of stock um, that's just created these tremendous distortions in how these companies are run and they're run in very short term ways. So the whole time Nasdaq is now hemming and hawing about these China companies. Well, they never closed their office in Beijing. So even after all of the delisting scandals, all of the companies on NASDAQ from China that turned out to be frauds, they still had a marketing office in China, as did NYSE. And I think it was back in 2012 or 2013. I can't remember whether it was the chief rep of NASDAQ or of NYSE, but gave an, in China, gave an interview in, to Chinese media in which he slammed, you know, criticized U.S. short sellers as being tremendously unfair. I mean, and this is after NASDAQ had to delist, I mean, dozens, if not over 100 of these companies. So NASDAQ has never changed. One other thing that I'd point out, I think it was in 2017, I was doing a Bloomberg interview, and the interviewer, who ironically was British, um, asked me this question. She said, uh, NASDAQ uh, chairman uh, Tom Farley was, oh, you know, actually, I'm sorry, I'm talking about NYSE. So NYSE chairman Tom Farley recently testified before Congress and called short sellers un-American. Are you un-American, Carson? And look, Na you know, NASDAQ came up with this recent cosmetic change. It's not hard for companies to make it. NASDAQ and NYSE are like this. They are both co-conspirator, they're, they're co-conspirators in bringing all of these frauds uh, to U.S. investors. So I think this is emblematic of what they're really thinking. They want the listing fees, they want the trading commissions, but they really don't want to act as regulators or enforcers. That's that they abrogated that role a long time ago. So, so on that point, I think it, it, I would like to just, just stay on, on that point of, of exchanges and conflicts of interest. It's something that I, uh, when I was at the OECD, uh, we wrote quite a bit about about how exchanges separate uh, or address conflicts of interest, what responsibilities they then they devolve uh, as self-listed entity to the securities regulators. And that's a conversation that, as we both know, started in the 80s with the uh, demutualization and the subsequent listing of the Swedish Stock Exchange and, and everything that's followed um, after. And, and in fact, I think it was interesting because prior to the Aramco, uh, um, potential listing of Aramco, as it explored different options, uh, as you recall, the London Stock Exchange also offered to lower uh, some of its listing standards for uh, premium issuers for state-owned companies. So the timing was also quite, um, quite uh, interesting. But I think as we think of this world of exchanges, which are, as you say, commercially listed, commercially oriented self-listed companies, uh, I think the question is, is, is um, is it likely that in the current environment with SEC saying, you know, listen, we might not be able to enforce as you think we might be, and the exchanges saying, well, you know, we're self-listed and our priorities are also not only, at least not only regulatory, but also commercial. Are we likely to see more cases uh, of, of uh, fraud in, in these types of foreign issued companies more so than in, in, uh, in, in other listed companies and also in relationship to the current crisis. So it, it is more, are more companies likely to wash up naked on the shore in your view in the next few months? Well, I don't know about the timing or the next few months. I mean, it's, you know, what, what broke the luck in fraud. Um, I mean, it's so 
if you look at Luckin, there was a lot of there were a lot of smart money hedge funds that were page one holders. Now, I believe that they knew or suspected that it was a fraud and that they didn't care. And the reason for that is there had been no enforcement in the space, the China to US space since 2012. And why hadn't there been? Well, it's really hard. So whether you're talking Emirates, Saudi, China, if the foreign governments do not want to cooperate, then it's really difficult for regulators to get any traction here, number one. Number two, these invest investigations are incredibly expensive relative to investigating a home issuer because you have all of these documents that are in foreign languages that have to be translated. And then you have you know, US or UK or whatever qualified lawyers who don't understand the documents and need to then familiarize themselves with the significance and the legal framework and the context. So it's, these are very difficult investigations. And if the home governments are going to be intransigent vis-a-vis uh, -vis the investigators, they lead, they really don't lead anywhere. So we were in this environment where there'd been really, there'd been no attempt at enforcement in the China to US space for years. And then the other thing is, you know, one of the things that I think is just really fundamental here, um, and it would apply to any of these EMFM if these people are not prosecuted, is when we came out of the financial crisis, the, the prevailing thinking, which is not wrong, is that there's a problem when you have this asymmetry of risk and reward. So for the, all these individual traders, the equation was, you know, if I'm a trader, heads I win, tails I don't lose because it's somebody else's money. So we regulated that out of existence for the most part, that asymmetry. But when you look at what's happened in China, so literally hundreds of confirmed frauds and not one PRC national who was a chairperson of those companies has been materially punished by the US authorities. There was one chairman of a company who did go to prison in the U.S. I think his company was l and Energy, but he was from Taiwan, and that's why he was within reach of the law. So when you have that system, that basically says to a whole, I mean, that says to millions of business owners in China, hey, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by trying to defraud U.S. investors, and maybe next it's going to be London or wherever, because... If it doesn't work out, you know, you're, you're no worse off than you were. And if it works out, you've made tens, hundreds of millions, case of GSX on paper, billions of dollars. So that, that's part of the problem here. So if we go back to, so perhaps last question, because we, uh, we keep these dialogues to about half an hour, and this is a fascinating conversation. I would love to have you um, back on the program, but just to, to close with a, perhaps a last thought in a few sentences, particularly, um, you know, perhaps some thoughts from, from your end to institutional investors, as we um, discussed. I mean, there's an issue with uh, index providers and, you know, politics of capital markets today. Um, Obviously, most of institutional money, and this is an enormous debate and, and of great concern to me personally, um, are tracking indices. Um, how concerned are you around sort of the, let's say, the, the landscape of, of uh, the risks facing institutional investors, both as far as, you know, these foreign issues are concerned listed in the U.S. markets, but also in terms of them basically blindly tracking indices um, and not really being aware of in many cases, or at least in some cases, of the governance risks that uh, these companies uh, present in some of the emerging markets that they're tracking? Okay, well, I have, a, so first, China specifically, um, I think in the best case scenario when these companies are, you know, fairly real, I mean, we're financing companies that are arms of the Chinese Communist Party. And the Chinese Communist Party, I do believe, is a corrosive influence around the world. We're becoming more like China, you know, and that's really depressing. And if it can happen to us, it can happen to you, wherever you're, wherever in the developed world you're sitting. So I think that there's a moral issue that one must consider when 
financing or providing liquid market to securities of, say, Baidu. Now, putting China to the side as a general matter, um, when I used to, well, I'll bring China back in the conversation, but this is EM generally. When I used to have a non-financial business in China, um, and I co-authored doing business in China for dummies, I did a lot of speaking. I met with a lot of groups of foreign business people, foreign business students. And when I would have these conversations, they would always pose the question, but, you know, but why, why would they lie? You know, why would they lie to me? And I asked, or I'd say to them, when you're talking about these countries where there isn't really a strong rule of law, and you know, to be honest, you effectively have no recourse. Um, the question you need to ask is, why would they be telling me the truth? You know, we come from high trust societies where that's the default assumption. Somebody's telling me the truth because we have a developed legal system to enforce that. There are far, far fewer information asymmetries, so reputation matters a lot more. Um, you're not necessarily at a huge home field disadvantage if you're German and you're doing something in France and there is a legal system. But none of those things are the case in emerging markets. So the question you really need to ask at all times is why would this person be telling me the truth? Now it may turn out they are telling you the truth and there's business to be done. Great. But you cannot go in with this. You have to reverse the assumptions about the orientation of the people with whom you're dealing when you go into EM. Hmm. So, well, that, that's uh, probably uh, <laughs> the, the big statement uh, that we can perhaps end this conversation with. I mean, clearly uh, cultural differences and biases. And again, it would be a pleasure to have you on this program to explore uh, some of these issues um, in further detail. But thank you uh, so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to share um, some of your concerns and preoccupations in this specific two cases, but also on, on the broader capital markets picture uh, with our audience. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you. And um, just for, for the purpose of our audience, those of you who are interested in this conversation uh, around foreign issuers and some of the risks that they present, um, obviously uh, much can be gleaned from the, from the site of uh, Muddy Waters directly. Uh, we have been publishing as Govern quite extensively in Bloomberg, FT, uh, and other um, uh, financial media sources, uh, our views on, on, on the unfolding sagas of NMC and lock-in and also have a forthcoming case in the Harvard corporate governance blog uh, talking about some parallels uh, between these two cases and some of the concerns that we have. And certainly um, uh, the documentary that Carson mentioned, which is the China Hustles documentary, for those of you who wish to explore this issue further, is a, a fascinating um, look. But um, thank you for joining uh, this governance dialogue and we look forward to having you join for, on future occasions.